I'm going to talk a little bit about really the last, what I've been doing for the last five years. I used to study computer science at UCL and, uh, and then I kind of shifted into biotech and specifically biotech outside of big institutions, outside of industry. So kind of ordinary people getting involved in genetics and biotechnologies, uh, artists getting involved in what's called biomedia art. Um, and in particular, uh, two things. Um, I'm going to talk about synthetic biology, uh, which is sort of an approach to bring more engineering into biotech, into genetic modification. And then also about DIY bio, which you can kind of guess from the name is, um, is they also call it biohacking. It's kind of this whole ethos of uh, taking things apart, understanding them uh, with very low cost tools. Um, there's hacker spaces here in London where people take apart electronics and radio and build new things. And this, people are getting more and more into doing this with laboratory tools and molecular biology. Um, and so five years ago, I was studying computer science at UCL, and I saw an image uh, which was a, a kind of yellow plate uh, that was a biofilm. It was, it was a colony of bacteria growing, growing on a plate, and it had a word on it that said, hello world. And um, does anyone know, uh, know the significance of those words? I sh anyone who's ever programmed a computer knows that hello world is always kind of the first computer program that you write the first message that you make a computer um, say. And this was a group uh, at, from Texas who made an image of bacteria saying hello world. They basically reprogrammed a very common lab bacteria called E. coli to be able to reproduce an image. So they gave it an extra ability to retain um, color information. They shown this hello world picture onto it as a negative and then it stayed on the, on the plate. Um, so this was, one, on the one side, very clever marketing of these students because they knew that that phrase would really evoke something in people like me who are from electronics or computer science. Um, and it, it, it really summarizes the whole ethos and the whole ambition of the field of synthetic biology to try to make a design, a computer discipline uh, from biology. Um, and so I was completely hooked by this and I thought, great, uh, I get away with, rid of my laptop, let's program with biology. And they really made it sound a bit too easy. It's, it's much harder than that. But it's, uh, that, that got, me, um, got me excited that, at that point. Now what's also really important is that that image uh, and that, that reprogramming, reprogramming of that bacteria wasn't done by a team of professors or a team of postdocs. It was actually done by undergraduate students. And that's pretty strange if you've ever worked in a laboratory. Um, undergraduate students usually uh, aren't really trusted to do anything. Um, and what, what happened uh, about 15 years ago um, was a guy called Tom Knight at MIT, uh, he used to be an electronic engineer, got really interested in biology. And he looked at labs and, uh, you know, and, and he kind of noticed that every lab was using slightly different enzymes to work with their DNA. And um, he kind of missed what he was used to from electronic engineering, things like parts catalogs, things like standards, the idea that you can just take two things and put them together because you know, they, they, they've been designed as standard parts. And so he had this idea to come up with an engineering standard for DNA. Um, he just decided to, um, rather than 200 enzymes that you can use to, to cut and, and put those DNA pieces together, uh, he would just use four. He'd just say, ah, I'm just going to se select four random ones, and then every DNA that you work with has to be cut or, and, uh, with those four enzymes. And that's a bit, it's a bit of a restriction, because sometimes it, doesn't, it, it, it limits you. But overall, of course, that meant that you could use the same method over and over again to, to assemble pieces of DNA. And he called this standard uh, biobrick standard. So he kind of took, um, he kind of defined a standard that makes it very easy, relatively easy to put two pieces of DNA together uh, and, 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 sh and across and, and ship them across. Um, and then he also opened with uh, colleagues um, a, a website called the Registry of Standard Biological Parts. And it was just a big online Wikipedia type website where now you could you could basically um, upload, um, you could now upload the information of a certain bio brick and say, okay, this bio brick uh, has this sequence um, and it does this kind of thing. It, it might be a sensor for arsenic. 
Um, and this other biobreak might be a, a reporter. It creates GFP, green, green fluorescent protein, which is a standard kind of reporter protein that you put into a, into a cell uh, and it makes it glow under fluorescent light. So it's kind of a reporter. Um, and, and now uh, you can go to this website, order the DNA, put them together because you know they always use the same method and, and very simply you can create genetic circuits. It's all kind of modeled on this metaphor of electronic engineering. So pie pieces of biobricks put together is then a genetic circuit. Um, it's a bit of, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty steep simplification, uh, but it really made uh, some of the lab work much easier. And, and the way they, these people who made this website tested that was to say, okay, well, we think we've made biology, synthetic biology, much simpler to use. Let's, let's just give this to a class of undergrads and give them three months and they can do whatever they want with it. They'll just make some new bio bricks and use them in a project. And everyone at the conference room, I imagine, 15 years ago was laughing at this fantastic joke. Uh, but they thought, okay, let's go with it and let's see, nothing will come of it. But actually, uh, after three months, uh, we had this image and we had some other, pic uh, some other projects. And uh, since then, this has grown over the last 15 years into an international competition where over 300 student teams from all across the world participate each year to create new biobricks and, and basically add to this repository of genetic information uh, and build uh, projects from those and, 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 create, and yeah, create new projects and basically compete on their science projects. It's kind of like, you know, um, I think once someone described it as a kind of robot wars for GMO, which is probably not a good thing to say. <laughs> but it's, it, it, is, it has a lot of fun kind of, it's, it's really an educational thing for undergrads to, do their own, to create their own genetics project. Um, okay, now I lost my notes. There we are. Um, and so I did that for, for about four years at UCL and, and was a really exciting time to, you know, I think in genetics it used to be, or it still is usually, that it takes you a long, long time to do, to, to do anything and to make, create your own project or to do your own research. Um, and so this was a really empowering thing for students to, um, to participate in. Um, and it, it kind of has, it's one of the themes, I think, of what I want to talk about is this idea of de-skilling, taking something that used to be, you know, used to take you three years in a PhD, suddenly through some standardization and through some good design, you know, a, a group of trained, but not as, mu not, not as much as a PhD student, undergrads can do in three months. And um, this, is, this is pretty interesting. Um, and so then I was doing this for a while and as I, I read probably in a magazine like Wired, uh, about biohacking and DIY bio. And I specifically remember that there was a group I Googled, uh, I Googled, I think I Googled whether this existed in London and there was a tiny group uh, in East London in Hackney that was a biohacker group. And I thought, great, because you know, you always, there's 300 student teams that participate in this competition called iGEM. It's very hard to make yourself notice. So I thought, well, if we can do a great collaboration with these biohackers, that's gonna really uh, impress the judges. It's gonna be really interesting. And, and we can get so much done because we have all this army of, of citizen volunteers uh, who will do lots of pipetting for us. And so we went there and um, unfortunately it didn't turn out, it turned out that they were really interesting, uh, in, really interested in doing uh, synthetic biology and genetics, but they didn't really know what to do. And so the whole thing kind of shifted and became a basically a training exercise. And we wanted to see how long it would take, how, how long it would take for them to be able to participate in iGEM. Um, and uh, moreover, we noticed that although this parts registry had the language of open source, just like open source computing, um, you actually had to be part of a university to be able to engage with it. Uh, if you were outside of an institution, you couldn't just get uh, the genetic material from it, um, which has a lot to do with institutional rules at universities, so I understand it now, but it kind of was an easy point for us philosophically to say, okay, well, this doesn't really Com comply with the ethics of open source, so we're going to critique that and we're going to try to facilitate uh, a group of citizens participating. And so we spent uh, three months uh, training up this group of uh, citizen scientists here uh, through all the legal and safety, uh, tests, uh, saf safety um, uh, regulations, um, trained them up to, to read the papers and get the information of creating a bio break. And, um, and then we also built very, very simple lab equipment in their space. So we built, for example, in an Argos fridge, fridge box um, with a light bulb and a kind of pencil that was shaking, a shaker incubator. It, was the, uh, it worked for exactly 24 hours, which was how long we needed it to work for. 
Um, and, um, and so we did kind of, we tried to build really basic equipment that, uh, that replaced the you know, thousands, tens of thousands of pounds of equipment that we had at UCL. Um, and we did as much as we could there until we wanted to now take this new bio brick and put it into another organism to test whether it worked. And at that time, uh, you have to, if you want to do that, you have to have a proper labor licensed laboratory. So we moved into the teaching labs at UCL and continued that work. And it was the first physical piece of DNA, a bio brick, that was submitted into this registry and is in that registry that was made by a non-academic group kind of from start to finish. We helped a bit, but it, we, we were very keen for it to be there their work and their creative endeavor. Um, and for my co-founder, Bethan, who I met on that project um, and who founded the company that, um, that we're doing now, and me, this was really kind of a pivotal moment where we thought, wow, this is really interesting. We want to know more about this. And we decided to take, take this collaboration that we had with the biohackers and exhibit it at the Grant Museum uh, in Bloomsbury. Uh, and to do that, we also went on a kind of biohacker tour in, uh, in Europe. We went to Paris where there was a biohacker group uh, in an, uh, a suburb where you had to kind of go, it was kind of hidden. It's like a weird hacker space. It didn't really have to be hidden, but you kind of went, um, there's like a hole in the floor and you kind of, when you looked at it from the right angle, you could see a door and you kind of moved in and underneath was uh, all this science equipment and lots of people doing interesting things. Uh, they've now, um, with a lot of funding from the Paris mayor, moved into a beautiful central building. Um, and we went to lots of these spaces and we talked to, to all these people just because we wanted to present in the Grand Museum a kind of overview of, of, of the different spaces, the different ideologies and the different uh, challenges that they were facing. And we also um, curated some artworks. Uh, so, for example, um, we showed a piece uh, that was uh, from an Indonesian group where they um, uh, called the House of, Nat uh, of Natural Fiber, where they had made music from fermentation processes uh, of, of alcohol. And th that was a very political point because they were doing all these underground workshops of brewing alcohol, because at that point, the, uh, the military had outlawed um, alcohol. And so lots of people started home brewing without actually having the right skills. And uh, if, you, if you brew alcohol, but you don't really know what you're doing, it's very easy to poison yourself. Uh, and so uh, that's what, that was happening in Indonesia a lot at the time. So there was kind of like an underground movement to teach safe practices of brewing. Um, and they, uh, they kind of uh, you know, made this into a, a social workshop, a kind of critical making, hacking, as well as um, you know, art as process. Um, we showed another piece, or well, we discussed another piece um, called Common Flowers from a group in Tokyo um, called BCL, which I later worked for, um, where they had taken a blue rose that a company called Suntory makes. If anyone knows Lost in Translation, that's the whiskey brand. <laughs> but there's a huge conglomerate, so they also make the first or the, one of the only uh, consumer genetically modified organisms that you can buy. So it's, it's, a, it's a blue rose that you can buy at most Japanese train stations. And it's, an, it's a GMO, um, you know, it's the kind of flower breeder's dream, a blue rose that you buy for like weddings and, and, and things like that. And it's, it's, a, it's a GMO that's not for agriculture, not for health, it's just for pure aesthetic pleasure. So it was kind of an interest, it's a, it's a very interesting case study. Uh, but you can only buy the cut roses, you can't buy the seeds. Uh, and so they did a, an intervention where they basically cultured that uh, and, and made available that protocol so anyone can culture that rose and, and create new ones. And it's kind of obviously asking a lot of questions about the proprietary nature of, you know, of a GMO and of living, you know, having a proprietary living thing, but also the, the risks of spreading GM, genetically modified organisms. Um, and so this fit really nicely into this exhibition because we called it the right or the risk for to, to, you know, to do this biohacking because obviously many people get you know, rightly worried about the ethical implications of, of genetic modification and also just the, the safety of it. Um, and from that biohacker tour that Beth and I were doing in 2012, um, one of the things that we always kept hearing was that um, there wasn't really a standard platform. And it, it seemed, uh, for biohacking, it seemed a bit like, like the kind of 60s, 70s with computers before Apple came along and, and everyone bought that Apple II and, or Apple I and, and rate, wrote software. We were kind of in that phase. And we, to, uh, to some extent, it's changing now, but we still are when many people in this DIY bio community are building hardware. Everyone's very obsessed with building PCR machines, which are kind of copying machines for DNA, or building centrifuges. And you attract a lot of uh, computer scientists and electronic engineers and makers, and they make that. 
but this, the group of people who are actually doing biological experiments is much smaller. And it seemed to, to us to be very much like the 60s where everyone was building hardware, but the people who wanted to write software didn't really, weren't really part of that group because they didn't have computers. And um, we kind of felt that just as there is an electronic making things like the Arduino, which is this great platform for people uh, and artists to, to very simply, very easily and cheaply make electronic installations, or you know, of the Raspberry Pi from Cambridge, that's a kind of mini, very cheap mini computer that many people uh, learn programming with. Uh, we felt that it was necessary to have a kind of starter um, platform to do biology with. Um, and we initially called, we, we decided uh, to try to do that and build a kind of essential biohackers lab. And we called that Darwin Toolbox because we were based at the Darwin building in UCL at the time, and we thought it was a good name. And I think it was even an anniversary. Um, and we decided to put three pieces of equipment in, into that box. One was a centrifuge. One was a PCR machine, I just mentioned. It's a copying machine for DNA. And the third piece of equipment was essentially a visualizer that allowed you to, to look at fragments of DNA. It's called gel electrophoresis. And it basically means you put fragments of DNA into a kind of jelly-like substance, and then you run a high current through it, and basically that pulls the fragments of DNA through the gel um, because the, me molecular, uh, the, the molecule of DNA is negatively charged, so it goes towards the positive. It's a bit like chromatography where you know, the, the larger the molecule, the, the longer it'll take to, to travel. And so after about half an hour, you get kind of a barcode. You've probably seen this on things like CSI or whatever, when you have like a genetic fingerprint. Um, and so those three piece, pieces of equipment we chose because with those three things, you can do basic you can do basic DNA analysis uh, experiments. Um, and for the next two years, uh, we, um, you know, we, we, we started by just going to make affairs. And uh, the first one was a week after we decided to do this, we went to Rome to the European Make Affair, where about 50,000 you know, people over three days we looked at 3D printers and robots and drones. And we were there with a tiny booth. And we just had, uh, we, we had started a week ago, so we had nothing. We just had a flight case that we bought. And we made some labels. And we just kind of made a sculpture that said, this is our bio lab. It's not there yet, but what do you want it to be? Uh, so we kind of just used that as a, as a device to have, do market research and to talk to people. And we talked to, I don't know, 500 people over, the, uh, over that period and got a lot of feedback. And that kind of propelled us forward. And the nice thing was that then we were able to go to UCL and get periodic uh, small grants to do science outreach. And basically, that we, were, we committed to do workshops. But to do the workshops, we had to build the equipment so we could buy from the grant uh, the stuff that we needed to build the equipment. And so we built a few prototypes over, over about a year and a half. And um, then we graduated. And at that point, we had a lot of interest. Uh, we had some prototypes. We'd done some workshops. And, um, and that was it for then. We kind of thought, OK, this was an interesting kind of student hobby project. Uh, but we're not sure whether we're going to take it forward. And uh, I went to Japan at that time. I had, a, had a, a grant to go there for a year and do whatever I wanted to do. So I decided to work with this group of artists that I talked about. But we kind of kept working on, on, on the project that we now call Bento Lab, because I was in Japan. And, uh, and, and interestingly, we get a lot of inquiries from Japan, I think just because of that name. Um, but. Um, one of the nice things, I was working with this group of artists there um, on, on a couple of different projects. Um, a lot of them had to do with creating workshops um, for lots of ordinary uh, citizens to, uh, or not, you know, everyone, but people from all walks of life to interact with uh, genetics. So we had for a month uh, in, in, in central Tokyo um, a kind of food cart um, that we made into a biology laboratory. And I was there for a month having to do a different experiment each day. And so people would come up and say, oh, can I have a, have a coffee? in Japanese, so my Japanese got very good at that in that month. And I said, no, coffee arimasen, we don't have coffee, but I have the, prepared this experiment today. Do you want to take part? Do you want to have a conversation about this? And so it was a kind of great way to, to engage people. And um, it was a good month for me to prototype a lot of interesting experiments that might also be done with, with this bento lab thing. And so I spent this, that year, uh, amongst other things, thinking about not just the lab, but also how, how you can engage people around you know, instructions and how you can teach um, genetics with this kind of basic equipment. And uh, at that, and then in that, in that year, Beth and I were Skyping a lot and we really decided to say, okay, maybe uh, we're not gonna do a PhD now, maybe we're gonna do, we're gonna do this for real. Um, 
And the first thing we did was just have a call on our website and said, that said, okay, if, if you are interested in, teach, in, in testing Bento Lab, uh, apply here for beta testing. You have to pay 500 pounds because otherwise we <laughs> can't do, do it, but uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna make 20 of them and if you want one, you can have one. So we had uh, a, 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 a biohacker space in Canada uh, um, test one. We had a researcher in New Zealand who used it to teach who still uses it to teach his classes, but also to go into the field and do uh, kind of biodiversity field research. Uh, there was a group of pensioners in, in, um, in Wales. I have no idea how they found us, but we got an email um, that was, oh, we're, we're, we've been working on, we've, we've been uh, looking at fungi for the last 20 years. This is our hobby. We're mycologists. Uh, this is a big amateur community. And they go around, they take pictures of all kinds of different fungi species. And they said they want to take their citizen science to the next level to, and do DNA testing. They work with a university, but they want to do their own sample prep and do their own uh, PCR and DNA barcoding. And so that was great. And so they, they're using Bentolab. And the, the final one I'm going to mention is, is a citizen science project in, in, in uh, Switzerland that uh, is called Beer Decoded, where they test the, the genetics of the yeast used in different microbreweries and in different uh, beers and kind of link the, the, the taste experience of the beer to the genetics of the yeast. Um, so if you have a beer that you really like, you can, you can have it tested against other beers and maybe give some recommendations about what other beers you might like from the genetics of the yeast. Um, but I, I would, this project I really like because it shows, it's kind of a, one of those examples of things that you wouldn't really expect to come um, out, uh, you know, from, from business as usual. It's when, it's when different interests come together and the tools are affordable and easy to use enough for a broad coalition of people that interesting projects can happen. Um, okay. So yeah, um, we made those 20 labs. What we had totally underestimated was how different it was to make one prototype and to make 20 of them. And we, we pretty much ran out of money, out of time. It was a terrible experience to make those 20. And we wanted to give up many times, but somehow we per persevered and we got a lot of great feedback from it. Because one of the things we were worried about was that we had built this interesting contraption. This, it looks a bit like a laptop, uh, you know, it's like a mini laboratory. And one of the things we, I was worried about before committing to do it as a real company was whether people just gave us all this great feedback because they saw a lab and biologists saw a lab, they recognized the equipment and they saw it was looked kind of like a laptop and they put those two concepts together in their head and saw the whole you know, projected the whole development of the personal computer onto that thing and onto their own field. And so it was a kind of great design fiction, a great narrative that we'd shown people and everyone loved it because they saw the future, even though it, it might not work as a real product for them. So that was something we really wanted to find out with this beta testing, whether people were actually using it in real projects and it wasn't just a cool sculpture that we made. Uh, I, thought that, I thought that was a really significant risk of that. Uh, but it worked for people. Uh, it was really difficult to make them, so we spent the, la the, the next kind of six, nine months to find the right people to work with to take it forward. So it's very different to make a, to hack together a prototype and then to make a product that, you know, that complies with European uh, laboratory safety uh, regulations and everything. So that was uh, my last year. <laughs> um, and then we went on to Kickstarter, um, which is this, I'm sure you've know, it's this platform where people can launch products and people can basically give you pre-order products and it'll only go forward if you get a certain level of funding. So that allows you to pay for your tooling and things like that. Because obviously if you make, if you make injection molded parts, you have to you know, put 20,000 pounds into that before you get anything. Um, and so we, um, we did that in April. Uh, we got 150,000 pounds, much more than we asked for. And, um, then, and we're gonna ship that from uh, end of September. And we're gonna ship a lab, but to people for in, in schools and education but also field researchers. Uh, but we also make a, a starter kit along with that uh, for people, many of who, we've, uh, who we talk to, who want to, uh, who are interested in getting involved in genetics, but who've never held a pipette before. And so we, we're now at the point where we can kind of take the last five years of doing workshops with that in, and, and package that into a kind of chemistry set for genetics. Um, for, the, for this century where we really focus on and making it social and, and making it a, a, an open-ended thing rather than a thing that you work through from start to finish. Um, so I think I have probably talked about, I, I, uh, I think I've probably have enough um, because 
I know that you want to do the game. Um, <laughs> I think I, I, I can just finish off with why I think this is important, and maybe we can talk more about this in, in the Q&A, but I think we, we focus a lot right now on computer literacy, uh, and, and I, I think it's great. I'm a computer scientist, so I think it's great when everyone you know, has more literacy and, and lots of people learn how to program. I think it's a really interesting way of thinking, but it's, it's only one particular way of thinking, and I think um, you know, things like learning about genetics and learning about biology is a very interesting complementary way of of, of approaching uh, the world and, and, and understanding how things work. Um, so I, I think what we want to push for is to make, to create space and to create opportunities for people to have a similar, experience, similar relationship with genetics as they have with other sciences. Um, right now I think we treat things like genetic modification a bit like uh, nuclear physics. Um, and I think it can be more like computers or electronics, where there are certain lots of lots of experiments that are very interesting, very benign, and uh, and can lead to a lot of interesting outcomes, such as the Beer Dakota project, amongst other things. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention.